<laughs> Chapter 4. From the Journal of Malari, dated November. I no longer understand myself. My thoughts stretch themselves into baffling elasticities. My brain is a labyrinth through which reason searches in vain for itself. I walk cautiously, yet I am lost. To think has become like adding a continually increasing column of figures. I sit and add. The figures will add up to a finite sum, and this sum will be the understanding of myself. I apply myself carefully to each figure. And say two and three are five. Five and seven are twelve. But as I reach what seems to be an end, I find more figures waiting me. I can no longer add up the fragments or interpret them. I must be content now to sit and wait until this part of me, my relation to myself, splinters into fragments and I become a dice box shaking with mysterious and invisible combinations. It is the phantom Rita that is threatening to drive me into darkness. Since I murdered her in the street, the hallucination has become overwhelming. It is with me almost continually. When I open my eyes from sleep, I find it waiting at my bed. The hallucination leaves me at leaves me when I am outside, although at times a trace of it returns and I seem to feel its presence within me, then behold it with my senses. I desired to create for myself a world within which I might love and hate, to be a god lost within his dream. Madness was necessary, so I embraced it. But my dream becomes the product of a Frankenstein. She, the hallucination, is more real to my senses than, than am I and I can no longer control her. My senses are unfaithful to me. They philander clownishly within this mirage of my thought. Then what is there left? I, this grim figure stumbling with its head down through a storm of denouncements. I persist, an unwelcome visitor, a bargain-hunting tourist in Bedlam. I remain. But it is a boast that laughs back at me for I will soon be a little plaything of my phantom. Last night I walked until I thought I had rid myself. Her eyes alone lingered. Her eyes moved like slow dancers. But I walked and said to myself, I am tired of nonsense. I am tired of, of this monotonous hallucination. At least let me be unfaithful to my dreams, since I am the God who created it. I walked to the street where a month ago she had followed me under the arc lamp. It was cold and I grew tired. I came back to sleep. Gone, she is gone, I whispered to myself. The room appeared empty. I was cautious, knowing the ruses of this thing in my mind. For my madness and I are no longer friends. My madness hides for me and plays tricks. But she returned. I smiled at her. It is a folly to grow angry with one's own hallucinations. That would be double madness. As she stood before me, my treacherous senses leaped into their sterile feast, and I smiled. My egoism has betrayed me, I reasoned. The love that gleams from the eyes of this hallucination is an invention of my egoism. Alas, I love myself too much, for the passion for Malare with which my madness endows this illusion of a woman threatens me. My senses have already abandoned me. They no longer obey the direction of my will. And I must stand like a skull, like a skull, laughing and sneering at them as they yield themselves to her. She came and knelt beside me, and I shook my head at her. She was dressed in a gown I had never seen before. It was red. I spoke aloud and said, See how abominably clever I am. My madness is a jack of all trades. It makes new dresses for its phantoms. It arranges their coiffures. It even puts rouge on their cheeks. But as I talked to her, hands reached out to me. To look into her eyes that are always alive with flames is to succumb. For then I find myself dreaming my dream is not a dream. My senses clamor that I join them. Forget, forget, they whisper. Come with us. But I choose to persist. I remain, to sit in an empty whorehouse. And masturbate. No. If this hallucination grows powerful enough to trick my senses into clownish fornications, let my madness enjoy them. Not I. We are no longer friends. My madness.
Venus and I. She pressed her cheek against my leg. I could feel her body trembling. I remained motionless and spoke to her. Each night you grow bolder, I said. I am no different from other gods in that I seem to have endowed you with the instinct of profanation. But at least Eve did not turn on Jehovah with the horror tricks learned from his apple. There is consolation, however, in the fact that I, too, can remain indifferent. Indifference is the wisdom of God. You may play with me, yet I know that the burn of your hand on my body is an absurdity, of interest only to my idiot senses. My arms reach out to embrace you. Your breast surprised my fingers. Come sit in my lap if you wish. No, I would rather enjoy you as before, standing before me, naked. Take off your clothes. While I talked, she clung to me. Her lips passed kisses over my face. I continued, however, to observe, to remain a spectator. She removed her clothes, tearing them from her body and laughing, and standing before me naked, but, but for her black silk stockings and red slippers, she held out her arms. But I shook my head and smiled. I am the victim of an overwhelming desire to masturbate, I said to her, since I find it difficult to resist you. But if I yield to the mysterious reality you have assumed, I will become too grotesque for my vanity to tolerate. I will remain aware while possessing you that my penis is beating a ludicrous tattoo on a sofa cushion. I choose rather to emulate the pride of St. Anthony, who shrewdly refused to play the whoremonger with Shadow. I smiled at her and she laughed. She crouched on my feet, staring up at me. Raising my eyes from her, I saw Goliath. He was standing in the curtains of his room, watching me with a curious, open-mouthed fury. I saw that the little monster was beginning to understand that I was mad, and this irritated me. There was a danger in him, since even though, even through this stupid head, he must have passed a wonder about what had happened to Rita. I frowned at Goliath, and his head rolled frightenedly on his heavy shoulders. Why do you bother me when I wish to be alone, I cried. Go to your bed and leave me. I stood up and went for him. His head fell, and he dragged himself back into his room. This was perhaps the most curious thing in the incident. I am ashamed of being seen with this new phantom, I thought. For a moment the mad idea came to me that she was visible to Goliath that he was watching us, me and this figment of mine. My anger was shame. My senses are logical in their pretenses. How can I stand out against them if I grow, if they grow cleverer than I, more persuasive than I, and led me finally to the total madness of accepting them as Malari, the one Malari, the lunatic who has escaped himself? I must not escape. When I returned, she was still crouching on the floor. I decided to experiment. Perhaps there was still some lingering sense in me that would fail to succumb to this astonishing make-believe. Come here. On the couch, I ordered her. She obeyed. She stretched herself out and I sat beside her. The odor of her body was distinct. Perfume spread a clever gloss over a woman's smell, the bitter salt odor that stirred from between her closed thighs. I smiled, for the logic of this illusion grows entertaining. But I decided on experiments. My hand stroked her hair, feeling its strands. My fingers pressed the skull beneath the warm skin of her head. And I held her breasts. That once seemed to me like two little blind faces raised in prayer. But imagery no longer decorates my thought. My hallucination is no longer a lever of magical phrases. But stark real, its heart beating under ribs its skin glowing with perspiration, its nipples standing out. As I crossed her, I heard her say, Yours, yours, I am your woman. Her thighs opened and, arms, and her arms that had been held toward me fell to her sides. My hand slipped between. There was warm flesh. Yes, it was flesh to my mind. And I sat for moments, allowing the illusion to stir passion in me. 
I would throw myself on this thing, hold it in my arms, give myself to it. Where was the wrong in that, since it's only myself I've ravished, a phantom mocking me from behind my eyes? Goliath saved me. I saw him standing once more in the curtains of his room. His long arms were beating against his sides, the black fingers opening and shutting like frantic talons. He stood with his head rolling as if he were trying to stand erect. His eyes were insane. I sprang away again, pulled by the unmistakable emotion of shame. He glared at me for a moment, but as my hand caught his face, he toppled over and lay whining. I picked him up and threw him to his bed and locked the door of his room. When I returned, she still lay. Her eyes were closed. She looked at me and she saw, and I saw she was weeping. Since you are not to be reasoned out of existence, since you seem to resist what is left of my sanity, there is nothing to do but tolerate you. I sat in my chair and spoke to her. It will end in my, it will end in my loathing you, I said. I created you in order to possess you beyond the realism of the senses. For a time, your body was like rich curtain before the door of enchantments, which I might enter at will. But there is no longer a door. Your body alone confronts me. In this way, I am reduced to enjoying my dream with my senses. Then it means only that I have achieved nothing more by my madness than the privilege of masturbating with the aid of an erotic phantom. Alas, the reason of it is clear. Man's fiber is foul throughout the sex. I sought to emancipate myself from all relation to life. The delusion of my hopes is more to be pitied than the disorder of my vanity. For I see now that man is a collection of adjectives loaned to a phallus. His intellect is no more than a diverting hiatus between fornications. His soul, yes, is very egoism, on which he prides himself, is a synthetic erection. To possess, what a delusion. And for its sake I threw my genius away. I stripped the world from my eyes that it might not in, intrude upon the universe within me. A paradise in which I might strut alone, possess myself. You guys... Yes, and here I am, aware of, at last of folly. For my senses belong to life. And though I buried myself in madness deeper than night, they would still cling to me. <laughs> though I castrated myself, they would remain five inevitable testicles. It is impossible to possess. Folly to attempt. As long as the senses remain, life clings to like a dead whore to my darkness. Even my madness that I prided myself upon is battling which, which is astride a phallus her lips bending over with gruesome hungers. There is only one castration, death. What am I now? Mad, yes, and worse. Disillusioned. I have closeted myself with a lecherous animal and it turns on me. That is the reward of the privacy I hungered after. And you who lie and weep on a couch are no longer the, the dream of a god, but the crude marionette created by lust for its own diversion. I thought only to go mad, but I see I have become an idiot. <clears throat> there was no more to say. Her weeping ended and she vanished. But she will return, and my sleep her outline wanders like, a, like an amorous ghost haunting the grave of my senses. I must be ca cautious now, more cautious, always cautious. It would be so easy to yield. Death is no more than a premature torment. Its name alone is a suffering. It's reality, but a final illusion. But I persist. I still remain. There is a rhythm to things that still seduces me. A gentle curiosity that gives the lie to my bewilderment. I sit an audience, sh shedding crocodile tears at a melodrama. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Who can think that word is still himself? <clears throat> what difference does it make if I grow uncomfortable and swollen with illusions? I persist. And who knows but tomorrow will be a door in my labyrinth, a bottom to this pit into which I have fallen.